Well, hello and welcome to another edition of Archery Shop Shop Talk. I'm Jeremy. I'm TJ. And we're back with a super fancy microphone setup. I feel like a retard and I know I look like one, but hopefully we're getting towards some better audio for y'all. We got pop filters, microphones, wires going everywhere. So this should be interesting. Well, I think we're getting that high tech redneck stage. I guess. <laughs> Wasn't there a song about that? I uh, believe George Jones did that. Man. I think. Let me tell y'all what. We've had some interesting stuff happen in here today. Oh, man. We got an arrow that went through our back door, an arrow that went to the moon, people punching ourselves in the mouth, bows selling. Craziness. Overall, a good day today. Yeah. It was great. We, uh, had a young man first time getting into into uh, archery and he had a bow he brought in it was just a little bit too much for him so we did everything we could to tone it down we uh, twisted the string untwisted the cables got it down as low as possible and uh he was pulling it back and hammered his release and sent one through our back door <laughs> i mean like through the door outside it was funny though, you know. What I mean, there ain't no reason to get mad about nothing like that. But we, his, his, who was it? His uncle or grandpa? Whoever brought him was laughing. Was his so uncle. We, uh, we got a kick out of that one. And then he went outside, <clears throat> and you could tell his shoulder was breaking down. And he fired one. He hit the trigger accidentally, pulling it back again. This was another hour later, and he sent one to the moon. <laughs> she gone. Was he drawing it with his finger on the release, or did he actually have it behind it? No, he had it in front of it. Okay. He he had been doing so good, I'd quit even watching that part of it. And uh, all of a sudden, boom, he had it right where that bow lets off and let her rip. And the last I seen of that arrow, I mean, it was, she gone. She gone. So, this is something else. At least it didn't stick out under the porch. Like yeah. that one did from a couple years ago. If y'all, have, if y'all have been here and you walk in and look, I guess to your right as you're walking in, there's an arrow sticking in the wood up in the top of the roof at the porch out here. Uh, somebody had bought a bow for Christmas, and I kept trying to be nice and being like, you know, you got to put your finger behind the trigger or it's going, you're going to punch yourself in the mouth. Well, about, I even put my release on and showed him, this is how you do it. This is how I do it. A couple shots later, bam, he shot the porch and punched himself in the mouth and we just left the arrow in the porch to have something to talk about with people, but we tried to get it out, but she stuck. Yeah, we did. We got a ladder out, but she, I mean, stuck, stuck. So that, and then we sold a couple of bows. So that was cool today, but uh, all kind of good stuff happening. Getting here at Christmas time. Yeah, it's fast approaching. Um, ATA won't be that much longer. It seems it's crazy how quick. Every year is kind of like, to me, um, I guess starting the first of the year, it's like Christmas, and then boom, you got ATA, you know, first, second week of January, and then um, I like the ATA for a bunch of reasons, you know, as, of course, dealer only, you can't go as like a consumer, which, if it was up to me, I still think they should make it like a week-long show, and I know the manufacturers and stuff would get tired, but I think they should make it a week-long show. You know, the first three days or so be dealer only, just like it is now. But then open it up like on a Friday, Saturday or a Saturday, Sunday. And it'd be for the consumer, you know, where they don't hand out dealer prices and all that. But at least, I mean, it would, it would kind of suck because it, it would always be in one spot, you know, like this year's in Indianapolis. But I would imagine if you're a hunter or a big time bow hunter within five, six, seven hours of there, you would go see all the stuff. And they've already got it set up, you know what I mean? charge I mean, i'm just talking here but charge an admission to the general public you know because the dealers have to buy a membership and there's a ton of stuff that goes into that but um charging admission to help pay for the general public being there everybody's already got their booth set up just don't hand out the price list and that'd be it you know that's what i how i feel about it but anyway it's a dealer only show so we go to the ata first of the year you know that's where the shops get their better deals on stuff to order for the year but for me, more than anything, it just kind of gets me excited. You know what I mean? I get to see all the new stuff, and you can see how big the archery industry is. And I come back like, all right, I'm ready to, I'm ready to go. And then uh, you get to like tax time, which is a busy time for us. 
which probably ends around April, I guess. And then it's really kind of a slow time, but it's where we do a lot of our 3D stuff from like March, April till summer. And as far as the walk-in crowd, it's sort of slow during that time, but we keep it going with our 3D stuff. Then you get into after the July the 4th, and it goes from sort of dead because everybody's on vacation for a couple of weeks to wide hell, open. Yeah, all hell breaks loose for the next while all the way into October. And, uh, you know, this year it was so crazy because normally it's that first week of August yeah. when everybody – comes in starts coming in yeah it seems like it was like middle of july this year when it absolutely yeah. went crazy and so that we get through the busy season where we're just everything we can do trying to get everybody's bow fixed trying to get the bow strings made trying to sight people in set up new bows whatever we need to do crossbows then when our gun season starts early to mid-october it sort of tapers off some but that's when the new bows come out, you know, which is we've just, we're a month or a little, I guess more than a month now, but past all that. So we get a little bit of excitement about the new bows coming out. And then once we get into like early December, you start getting a lot of Christmas people coming in, you know, wives are wanting to buy a bow for their husband or their crossbow or whatever. So we're in the middle of that. And that is good through kind of the end of the year. And then, you know, right after Christmas, you get all the kids coming in, wanting to get their new bows sighted in and worked on and draw link set. And then we started all over again. So it's an exciting time of the year. We've got a lot of new products coming in. And we'll have even more. Usually from what sucks for a shop owner is, like, our goal, the new stuff comes out, usually in the month of October sometimes. So sort of the goal is you want to get rid of most of the old stuff right around October, and then there's a little couple-week wait from where the old stuff's gone and you're waiting on the new stuff. And people come in and they're like, man, y'all ain't got nothing. And I hate hearing that. And I'm like, we just, you know, I just wrote a $25,000 check. What do you mean we ain't got nothing? But, <laughs> you know, it's on the way or whatever. So, like... um you know, like a bunch of bear stuff came in the other week, and it's only about half of what we ordered. <clears throat> the prime stuff came out, and we got a couple bows in, but we're waiting on like 15 bows, and uh, I know they're behind, and, you know, I, I can only tell the customer what we know. I, you know, they just came out, they're behind. That's all I can tell you. We got yep. two of them sitting here. We got 15 we're waiting on. But sometimes it's hard for people to understand that part of it. But I'd rather be waiting on the new stuff and have a couple-week little period of, you know, whatever versus we have all the old crap that we're going to sit on forever. Or, you know, a guy comes in and there's a 2020 bow already out, but we're going to sell you in that 2019 because we just got a million of them. I seen Black Friday, I seen a bunch of shops trying to dump old bows, which there's nothing wrong with having old bows. You know, it's just most people want whatever's brand new. And that goes back to the whole, I don't agree with when these bows come out. It needs to be first of the year, not mid hunting season. I, I, I agree with you. Or if you're going to release them, go ahead and tell the shops or the consumer, these bows are not shipping until yeah, yeah. a certain date. That way, you know, because you release it like PSC, for example, October 1st, wasn't it? Yep. I don't know how many they had ready to go out the door with these orders. So is, what they what they give us, I guess, you, or not give us, but they'll call us and say, all right, we got new bows coming out October 1st. This is almost every company, you know, and their date will be different. But they'll say, we got, for PSE, for example, we got new bows coming out October 1st. We got a five, four or five bow preview pack, package that we're going to have at your shop the day or day before these bows hit the internet or whatever, or we advertise them. So we get those four or five bows, get real excited. And then it might be a month or two before they get more ready to ship because they've put everything they've got since July into getting these new bows ready. And I don't know. It just, to me, and I, they should have a pretty good forecast of what sells and that type of thing. I think they should slow it down, go back to old school, get a bunch of bows ready, and then come out with them in January and pretty much say, we got a good quantity and we're now ready to ship and let's do this thing. But I think that's the biggest thing, though, is if they would tell – us at the shop and you know everything's much internet based now facebook instagram yeah. twitter tiktok whatever i don't know of any archery company on tiktok yet um yeah. i'm 
I've kind of dabbled with it a little bit, but you like to watch them girls twerk. Yeah, <laughs> I know what you're doing. But if they give us a date, like an estimated ship date, that okay, yeah. we're releasing October first. 2020 yeah. bows are not shipping until December the first. That's yeah. You know, give I us agree. A, but every rep's gonna be like, oh man, it shouldn't be long because they want to get that money. You know what I mean? But. Mm-hmm. It sucks being the middle middle man on that part because, you know, we're face to face with the consumer, and we're being told, well, um, you know, it shouldn't be but a week or two, and then when it turns into a month or over a month, and then we look like a bunch of dummies, and we're just telling them what we were told. So, yeah, it just I don't know, it's so sketchy. And I will say I am very happy with PSC. We ordered a 2020 PSC lefty for a person. And I called them, and they were like, "Ugh, we're this could take a while." Uh, they said this um, this bow's not even scheduled to be made for like another month because we're gonna get all our right-handed stuff out first. And I was like, "Well, it is what it is. That's what they want, you know." So it only took what about a week and a half? Two yeah, weeks, I, two I was weeks maybe. And they, I was I shocked got, when you said already me the shipped message. it. Yeah, they didn't ship it, and I was like, "That is fabulous." So. Kudos to PSC for that. And even Bear, you know what I mean? Like Bear, we put in our order right after they came out, and boom, we got half of them. But at least we got some of them, yeah. you know what I mean? So well, I've been and happy. I think our Bear rep, when we wrote that order up, we were like a week before. That was, he came on a Friday. Yep. Monday was Veterans Day. That's right. And then like two weeks later was Thanksgiving, yep. So, which we just got past Thanksgiving this week. So, like, what, a week and a half ago they came in? Yep. So it was yep. a lot quicker than I was expecting. I was I was happy with that. I was thinking it'd be a while, but I'm actually happy with the bear lineup, you know. Um, I'm, tempted, I'm curious to see what some of this PSC stuff may look like, you know. It's crazy because across – we've talked about this on podcasts before, but across the board, bows are kind of slowing down but getting – more shootable or easier, you know, more comfortable, I guess is the way to say it. I was looking at Botech last night just because I couldn't remember what they'd came out with. And Botech's known for speed, you know, and they still got some speedy bows, the SR6 and stuff, but the new bows, the uh, Reckoning and mm-hmm. uh, what was the other one? Um, I can't remember the names of them, but, you know, they're slower bows, but they got all this tunability and all that, so that's pretty neat. I'm, I'll be be glad to get the ata and actually put my hands on the botex yeah. and you know obsession i seen some sneak some people i'm sure by the time this podcast comes out they'll have been released but uh right now there's five days until the release and i seen the shop leak some pictures and they look they look good i don't know how they'll shoot but i've always you said it earlier thought obsession was a good looking bow they do to um, me i don't know what it is they just yeah. it catches your eye yeah so. And they're fast and all that stuff, so we may play with a few of those. Um, and they're sort of local. They're like two and a half, three hours away from us. We're in South Carolina. They're right down below us in Georgia. But anyway, enough about that. What else you want to talk about? Oh, me. Um, let's give some shout-outs to some viewers and some listeners that we – did some digging around trying to see what else we could do and this was crazy <clears throat> so, you know i can pull up all the statistics from youtube and spotify and all these podcast things were on and on youtube it was about what i expected <clears throat> you know it's mostly men listening on here uh mostly between the ages of about 25 and 55 you know sort of what you'd think in the hunting crowd and about 70 something percent was in the united states you know <clears throat> but when I pulled up the podcast, the you know, the audio only statistics, we about fell out of the seat. <laughs> we did. It was surprising. So, you know, we just want to, you know, thank our listeners in Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Yeah. You know. We it, had a it, huge <laughs> amount of people listening in Canada on last week's podcast that we didn't even know we had. So thank you for listening and Maybe and, we need to find somebody from Canada that we we could talk to on the podcast. Yeah, we could video in or whatever because we have no idea about Canada hunting laws or times or anything. Yeah. So, and, and, and there's a lot from Australia. Yeah, I mean, it, literally, we about fell out of our chairs. So, if you're in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, 
hey, send us questions. You can email them to us. Yep. And, you know, U.S., we st- we appreciate you too listening. Oh, yeah. So Absolutely. we appreciate all everybody listening. Um, going to do things a little bit different different this week with our questions. I'm going to save them till the end and good. just see. And also, the question for this podcast is going to be, who introduced you to the outdoors? That's a good one. So I'll tell you, let me tell you a story about that from me real quick. Um, my, let me think of what year, 90, late 94, um, a guy that worked for my daddy showed up one day to work or whatever. And he had a, a Hoyt older, it was like an early nineties Hoyt compound bow. And he was like, man, I bought this thing and I am addicted to it. And I just bought it last week or week before y'all shoot this thing and you know, whatever. So my daddy shot it and was like, this is pretty cool. So he went to a pawn shop the week later and bought, it's, it's hanging in here, a green old bear, you know, old bow, you know, teardrop style bow. So of course I seen my daddy out there, um, shooting it. And I was like, what about me? <clears throat> so they, I think we ended up with a brown and micro Midas first, the first one. And then Dwight up here sold Mountaineer. So I ended up with a Mountaineer and it had like hatchet cams and was quicker. And then I don't my daddy had another friend named Bo, uh, Bo Kelly. And I love old Bo. He's good as gold. He he died uh, last year, and I hated that. He died. At, uh, somebody hit him. He was riding his motorcycle. But anyway, um, and I'd seen him about a week before that. But that's a whole other topic. But uh, Bo went and bought a Matthews, and you know was telling Daddy about it, and it's the best, and all this stuff. So Daddy went and bought a Matthews, and it was like I remember it costing like fifteen hundred bucks or twelve hundred or what. It was a lot of money for. I think this was ninety six at this point. So, of course, I wanted a Matthews, and they didn't make one short enough for me at the time. So, finally, they came out with that Mini Max cam, and I got my Feather Max and all this stuff. But And then from there, it goes. That's how I got into archery. We had, we had gun hunted a little bit before that. My daddy used to hunt, I guess, in the 70s and just kind of got out of it. And then his buddies got back into it. So, he, I guess, early 90s, 91, 92, 93, really, is when he started kind of getting into that. But... uh Anyway, that's my story. Yeah, mine's pretty much, you know, <clears throat> my daddy, he he got me out in the woods far back as I can remember. Anybody local listening, when you say, I say Apple, but Abbeville County, you know, once you get down there, there's a bunch of dirt roads on, and it's WMA land. I can't tell you how many countless hours I've spent riding dirt roads, walking, tromping through the woods down there, and I rifle hunted all my life until I think right after me and you became friends, I got my first bow and it was a pawn shop bow. I think everybody starts out with a pawn shop yeah. bow for some yeah. reason. And bow hunted for a long time, didn't kill any deer with it. And just like, well, I'm going to bow hunt for two weeks put, and get my rifle out. But yeah. I kind of stuck with it. And so we shot three to you. Took me to my first 3D, and it was you and Jason Long. Hmm. We went to uh, Mount Pisgah, North Carolina, and yeah. shot up there in the snow. I didn't realize that was your first one. That was the first one I'd went to. Um, we did some indoor yeah. at Kiwi with that first bow that I had, and then I think I had that little. I think I had a Z light. Yeah. When we went on the fir- when I shot the first 3D. And I just remember I've been hooked ever since. So Yeah. I remember speaking of uh tournaments, there was a store up here on twenty four called the Racing Station. And in ninety six they had some kind of a twenty or I don't think it was twenty five target three D shoot behind that store. And I don't even remember how we found out about it. <clears throat> I ended up not even taking my bow because I had just got mine. Daddy had just got his Matthews and we went and he ended up winning it and uh so from then it was like game on, you know what I mean? He loved it and I loved it and he shot up until early two thousands and then his elbow and shoulder and stuff kinda started hurting. So he still shoots a little bit before hunting season, but not much. But we for a couple of years there we shot a lot. 
and then uh, to, uh, 2002, three, I think I traveled all over the state and did some ASA shoots and all the state shoots and one shooter of the year and all that. But it's uh, I've been meaning to take a picture of that old store because it ain't a store anymore. It's just kind of like falling apart, but it still says racing station on the front just uh have but yeah we'll be i'll well, be cur- curious to hear y'all's stories of or you know how you got in or who got you into hunting that type of thing i'm, I'm sure a lot of it's mostly your daddy did it but uh, i'm sure there's some other stories too mm-hmm. but uh we've talked about crossbows on many on previous podcasts but i don't think we've ever kind of covered the bolt and the knot, any kind of information on the bolt or knot on crossbows. Yeah. And it can be a safety hazard. Yep. Had a guy come in, actually sitting down here in the floor beside me. He had bought a crossbow knock at a box store and nothing, that's you know, fine, <clears throat> but he bought the wrong knock on it. And the person that sold it to him thought it would work, but it would not um, seat. Yeah, it wouldn't seat right. So had it shot, we've seen people. Sh- the string will jump up above the the bolt, the arrow, and pretty much dry fire it. You know what I mean? Um, but it, usually you have a flat knock and a moon knock. There's only a few crossbows that use that flat knock, and it's older older ones now. Mostly it's a moon knock, and even on the, some of the ravens and stuff, you have something that looks more like a standard compound knock. You know, they call it like the U knock and all this, but make sure you're shooting the right knock for your crossbow because it could... It could turn into a dry fire or somebody getting hurt. A bad day. And then strings on crossbows. Um, we have a lot of people come in with a broke string on it. A lot. And there's varying talk of what happened, but it could. a lot of times it's that, or a lot of times it's they don't use the rail lube, you know, so it don't lubricate it. And just in general, a crossbow is, you know, a third of the size of a compound, and it's 150 to 200 pounds pull, so you're putting a lot of stress on that string. Mm-hmm. So just be safe. I mean, what would you say? Uh, I mean, the life of a set of strings, what, 250 shots out of a crossbow? That's what I'm guessing. That's what I'm guessing. I mean, I that, mean and you ain't really going to take a crossbow and go out and just shoot it, shoot it, shoot it, shoot it, shoot it like you would a compound. Like, you know, I'm gonna, every night of the week, I'm going to go shoot it 100 times. That's not really that way. Most people sight them in and then just occasionally fire them and – yeah, if, and you, do it, them and if you do it that way, I'd probably replace that thing about once a year. But anyway, those knocks sometimes can get sketchy. Yeah, just be sure you get the right knock. I know a lot of like Black Eagle with their executioners. They put both of them. They there. put. I think there's three knocks. It yeah. comes with like a U knock in it. A the half moon Mm -hmm. and then the flat back on them but you know so just make sure you get the right ones also make sure you're running the right length there too yeah because then sometimes if you don't shoot that in general there's 20 and 22 inches now this is out of a what i'm gonna call a regular crossbow i'm not putting raven as a regular crossbow because you've got to shoot their bolts you know yeah but um yeah make sure you're shooting the right length because if it's if it's a long crossbow with a long stock and you shoot a 20 inch sometimes if you put a broadhead on it won't even clear the stock or the the rail you know so it could dry fire it um we had some talk today about like how a guy came in and we were just talking about like how to fit a bow to an individual you know and he said why don't you or somebody said why don't y'all go over that briefly you know so if a guy comes in Generally, we make sure, see if we ask, are you right or left handed? And then you really want to know if they're right or left eye dominant. You know, if they hadn't shot before, is where I really start hammering that right or left eye dominant thing. You know, because if, if they already been shooting right handed forever, you're, even if they are left eye dominant, you're probably not going to change your mind. But I mean, you can try. So, uh, you know, the easy way to do that is like to hold your thumb out in front of you and then close one eye at a time. And which, you know, like if I close my, left eye my thumb pretty much stays where it's at but if i close my uh right eye it jumps over so my right eye is dominant anyway and then there's a triangle method and all this stuff but uh check their dominant eye you know right or left-handed bow then you know 
what kind of poundage have you shot before? Okay, if yeah, if yes, what poundage do you like? And most hunting folks are between sixty and seventy, but if they're brand new, you know, we might be looking at fifty to sixty. And a lot of bows will kind of go from fifty-five to seventy, roughly. Yeah. And then we measure their draw length. And to me, the easiest way to do that, there's a thousand ways to do it. Let me quickly tell you all of them. Number one. Okay, no, but um, <laughs> I measure wingspan, birdie to birdie, divide it by 2.5, and 99% of the time that puts you real close. You cannot, We've also got a, a test bow with a draw length arrow in it, but to me, that little bit of resistance, they're wanting to creep forward, and it ends up usually showing that the draw length is short. short yeah, and then you can also have them make a fist and put it up against like a wall and measure from the wall to the corner of their mouth, but again... According to how they're standing, that can change a lot. But wingspan is wingspan, so that to me gets it cl- real close, half inch close. You know, you know, within a half inch. Um. So then we know kind of what poundage. So generally, at that point, we we'll already have talked about you know what kind of price. You know, we ain't gonna, if somebody's wanting to spend five hundred dollars on a bow, we ain't gonna try to cram a thousand dollar bow down their throat, and we never have even in our whole history in archery, but. All right, so we'll get, you know, a bow in that price range that we think would be a pretty good fit. We'll get the draw length set, get the poundage set, all that type of thing, let them shoot at a time or two, you know. And if we got multiple bows in that price range, well, you know, what do you think about this one? If they want to shoot it, we set it up. Um, And on a side note, a lot of people don't realize, you know, 70, 75% of people come in here wanting to look at bows and shoot bows and we spend you know a good bit of time letting them do it and we're happy to do that but they don't they're not there to buy a bow that day you know what i mean there's a lot of time that goes into and usually they come back but it's just you know there's a lot of time that goes into that sort of thing and hopefully you've got a shop near you that will take the time you know not just be like well it's on 30 i know you're 27 you might rip your arm off but at least you can see what it feels like <laughs> you know and i don't understand if it's like a draw specific cam or something but if it's got a module surely somebody will set it for you but anyway so we we do that let them shoot it and then kind of go from there but and you can tell by the shooter you know if the poundage is a little crazy and they're struggling or whatever and then kind of go from there but that gets it fit to them and you know that's about a what a 20 30 minute process by the time everything's said and done yeah and it works out pretty good but you know, if it's a brand new shooter, it takes a little bit longer because, you know, you kind of got to give them a little coaching. Yeah, talk to, through the grip and the arm and the posture and that type, you know, how to anchor and all that stuff. But to, I'd rather have a brand new shooter. than we get a lot of people that come in and have bad form problems. And I'm like, you know, you're really gripping that bow or whatever. And for like two shots, they'll do it a little better So because I'm watching them. And then you'll get outside the side of man or do whatever. And here it goes again. It's just... They've learned it, you know, and that's what I really like about being where we are. Uh, if, if you're around here, you've probably been to the shop, but if you're not, we're probably 10 minutes kind of off the beaten path from town, but we can, sh- we've got a hundred yard outdoor range. So like, you know, if somebody comes in and says it's hunting season and they I don't, whether they buy a bow from us or not, I need to sight my bow in. We can walk out there for 20 minutes and have them, you know, 20, 30, 40 yard pin set or whatever, even, you know, you can shoot out to a hundred yards type of deal. So I think that's a big plus. And I often wonder though, if we were in town, my thing is, you know, shops that are in town, usually around here don't have an indoor range. So it's literally, they're just bolting stuff on the bow and handing it to them and saying, well, you know, have good luck when you get home pretty much. And that's, I don't (laughs) like that. I don't at least get them a 20 yard somehow, but Anyway, I'm, even though we're off the beaten path, I feel like we got a huge advantage having the range to be able to set people up. But that's a whole nother topic. Yeah, it is. But um, let's talk about stabilizers. I'd wrote that down. Most hunting bows don't need much of a stabilizer, six inches or less. Um, some of our bows we've put sidebars on hunting bows but it's it's always one that i'm i know i'm not going to be like walking far with you know what i mean there's no sense in putting a sidebar if you're going to be walking a mile and it's going to kill you yeah unless you got a way to throw it in a pack or something but uh a lot of bows we sell we don't even put a stabilizer on it a lot of them we put a four incher or six incher and it works out fine 
that's just the way I kind of run with it. You know, you get the occasional person that still wants a 10 or 12 incher with weight on it and all that, but they're usually more of an advanced. They want it an exact feel type of shooter. Yeah. Just like our sidebars, you know, my, when we had our bows hanging here with the sidebar, a lot of people were kind of like, do you really need that? And we're like, nope, it just helps us, you know? Yeah. I mean, a lot of people ain't running same setups we did with sights and everything. Yeah. So, I mean. Well, and the stabilizer is not really as much for vibration dampening as it once was. It's more for the balance of the bow, the stabilization of the bow. Yep. Um, you know, the more stuff you bolt on a bow, the more places there are for vibration to go you know even the smoothest of bows you put the sight and the wrist and the this and that on it and you can tell that it absorbs more of the, of the shock and stuff but so it's just a big that's what i always tell people it's preference and i'll look at what bow they got and unless it's an older bow that might need something big and bulky or bulkier like an eight or ten incher or 12 incher to kind of take out some vibration i'm always like six incher or a little doinker or something small you know what i mean yeah. just something small and it, you know that to me that's just a personal preference kind of thing yeah um i gotta get better at though I, i'm always like personal preference and there's a lot of people that's only shot like one stabilizer and they don't you know i mean they're looking for guidance i'm bad about i need i guess i need to start talking more when people ask me that but or i mean again we're happy to let people screw on 20 different stabilizers and see what feels better to them because it's just a simple pop it out of the package and and screw it on and shoot it which is another advantage to shopping at a local shop yep you can do that i, I mean i'm i don't know i guess if you went to a box store and they had the right employee working you might could do that but i don't know how that works me neither but while we're on the subject of stabilizers let's go ahead and jump in our questions all right um what's a good target stabilizer setup lengths and weight and this comes from texture looks like 513 is what i got um if i was going to set somebody up just he walked in and said i got this bow i want to i want he said target stabilizer yeah and i want to set up a target stabilizer never shot one before or whatever i would probably just out of the box set him up with about a 28 inch front bar and I don't know, according to how big a boy he is, a 12 or 15 inch sidebar, you don't want to break the shoulder. So I'd just put a couple ounces on the front, you know, two, three, four ounces on the front. And usually somewhere around six or eight, maybe 10 on the back to kind of get it balanced out. Um, that's where I would start. One cool thing we got in the shop that I hardly, well, we use it. But when it came out, I was like, I've got to have it. But it's that dead center bow balancing device. So it, what it is, is for a bow with a, that you got a sidebar on, you can add weight, take away weight, move that sidebar around. And what it is, it holds the bow by the grip exactly where your hand holds it. And it has ball bearings, front, back. I don't remember all the axes, but in all axes, front, back, side to side. So that you can move that sidebar and add and take away weight and get it perfectly balanced you know sitting there now for me if i balance my bow perfect in that thing i can literally draw it back with my eyes closed and look open my eyes and my level will be dead level there are some people that are used to putting more tension left or right or whatever on their bow so they may not but a good starting point is using that that machine or that device whatever you want to call it what do you think good starting setup I think a 28 inch probably is going to be your best bet because it's not super long, not yeah. super short. I'd probably meet in the middle and say a 14 inch back bar. Yeah. Um, 12, 14. I don't know if I'd go 15 because I, to me, I'd probably go 15 on a 30 inch bar. Yeah. So, I mean, but the way. I, on average, I guess we should tell them, you know, a tournament bar is really kind of between 26 and about 30 on average. There's yeah. longer ones and there's shorter ones. Yep. And on, on side, the side bars, 12 to 15 ish. And then uh, some of your bigger shooters, you know, they're shooting 8, 12 ounces on the front, and some of them are shooting 20 something on the back. But that's, <laughs> I'm talking about your shoulder better be ready for that. Yeah. I, I got eight ounce. I think I've got eight ounces on my back, no front weight. Yeah, I've shot like that before and had good luck. But right my, now I'm shooting a 28 inch bar. I've got eight on the front because I, I don't know. I tested it and I thought it was stupid because I don't like that much front weight and I held better. 
you know, I've got like, uh, I got a lot on the back, not 20 something, but I think I've got 12 or 16 on the back right now, but that's just what I'm playing with. But <clears throat> so I, you know, just, you know, starting out, I'd say go with a 28, 14. Um, that way you're not. And then the differences in like decent stabilizers and junk. We had a guy bring in some Chinese crap one time. And like when he shot, the thing bounced like yeah. the, a long bar that's not that great. When you shoot it, that thing's like boom, 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 boom. and uh, the better order. bars are, are don't do that. I mean, they might do it a tad, but it's not like it's going to fly your hand bad. I'm gonna correct that question. Come in from an eight five three texture. Mm. So sorry about that. Um, we get asked this question and we get calls on this constantly and we talk about clarifiers and verifiers and this mm. comes from the 910 area code so quick rundown a clarifier is used for a uh, site with a lens in it and it's it's where you got put a lens in your site and it could be a hunting site or a tournament site and the target's super blurry all right, so you put a use a clarifier to correct that. A verifier is when you just have a regular old pin sight. The target's fine, but your pins look blurry. So that's the difference in the two. And we get I, I need to stock more of them because in the past two years we've had a ton of people come in either wanting them or wanting to ask about them or whatever. But uh, yeah. but yeah, there's a ton of talk about that, and that really helps, especially like. If you can't see your pins, you know what I mean, and you don't have a lens or nothing. The only the the only downfall to having one is is it could possibly fog up or get water in it. So keep like a Q-tip with you to clean it out. But that's probably not going to happen. Yeah. I mean, I switched over running lens in, in my hunting bow, so yeah. I hadn't had any problems. But you know, just keep them clean, real good, and you know they should they shouldn't fog up too much, but there's that possibility yeah okay this one comes in from the texture 352 i bought a bow from cabela's my peep is crooked how do i fix it we see that a lot um a lot of your sub 500 hundred dollar bows kind of have junk strings on them uh they're just made quick they're not stretched you know all that type of thing and uh so, in, in other words, what happens, what causes it is like, it rests, your strings probably got, you know, 60 pounds or so of tension on it. But when you come to full draw, and you can check this, don't derail anybody's bow, but it almost has no tension on it at full draw. It's got like just a couple pounds on it. So, at full draw, if somebody's at full draw, you can reach over there and like their string, you can move it super easy. So, from, from that string going from a little bit of good bit of tension to hardly no tension the pressure changes and it causes rotation if the string wasn't made under tension and that type of thing so uh, i'll give you the quick synopsis um one is you're going to take it to a shop and have them put a twist or two in the string and that will straighten it up now if it's one of those junk strings it's probably going to keep doing it you know it might it might work for the next 50 shots but then you know you shoot in the summer or you whatever it might twist some more so then you know the ultimate answer is get a decent set of strings and of course we make and sell strings here archeryshackstrings.com i mean we got strings that start at 50 dollars and go up and our even our 50 dollars set of strings is way better than anything you know on those cheaper or i don't want to call them cheap but those mid to low end bows but I could talk about this all day because we make strings every day, but like, you know, from the start of our layout process through the serving part, I mean, they're stretched, 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 and they're twisted under tension, and there's a hundred things that go into it to make it work right, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, so my suggestion would be initially, you know, probably have your shop twist the string, like they had to put it in the press, take it off the bottom of the cam, put a twist or two in it, put it back together. You shoot it a few times, see if it fixed it or made it worse. You can also, if it's not twisted a lot, grab your string and hold it stationary and then twist that loop a little bit left or right. You know, you can do that at home. 
but I think the ultimate answer is to get a decent set of strings and there's a bunch of people that make them, you know, and you can spend 50 or 60 bucks and get a decent set. I mean, there's, you can spend 120 bucks and get a decent set. It's just that type of thing, but just look on, you know, I'd love to sell you a set, but if, if you don't use us, just make sure you look online, make sure everybody's got good reviews. There's not many bad string makers out there. I mean, I can't even think of anybody that's a bad string maker, but you get new people into it, you know, making strings and, uh, I'll see them online pop up and, you know, they're laying them out, not under tension or doing something crazy and it, they have some twist problems, but, and, you know, with any custom string maker, if something does happen, they're going to back it up, you know, so mm -hmm. that's a good thing. Let's see. Tim from, from Alberta hmm. says, what are advantages, disadvantages of limb driven and cable driven wrist? That's actually a good question. I remember when the limb drivers came out, I was kind of like, I don't know about all this crap. You got this big cord and it's going to the limb. And what if you catch it on something? And I had, just like everything else, I'm always <laughs> the one, first one to be like, I don't know about this. But I'm trying to not be that way because I've been proved wrong so many times. But anyway, cable driven, of course, goes the string comes off the wrist, goes into the cable, usually the bus cable that goes down, pulls it up that type of thing it does however put a little bit extra load on that cable and i have noticed if, if you got a bow with a cable rest you take the cable off and go to a limb rest or a biscuit or whatever it throw it the cam timing can change just a hair and it's because of that cable from the rest you know pulling on the bus cable the limb driver has a cord that goes up to the limb and as the limb flexes it makes the uh, cord get slack and the the um rest pops up once i started shooting a limb driven rest i was pretty much sold on it now i will say i try to be semi-cautious of not catching that cord on anything but even if i did it's a simple pull it back snug and tighten up a screw type of thing you know what i mean there's nothing much that can go wrong with it and very worst case scenario and the cord falls off i mean that's not gonna happen of course but the rest stays at upright position and you could potentially still shooting it be semi-close even though the fleshing are going to hit the rest so take that for what it's worth but I, i'm we sell still sell more cable driven than limb driven but uh and then to me probably tuning the limb driver is a little easier because you hadn't got to get that cord exactly the right length you know and get it coming up at the exact right time you just snug it down tighten it up when limb flexes it comes up you're good to go there you know i mean <clears throat> here here's what i'd be asking too is does the limb driver have more moving parts or less moving parts than a cable driven or is it vice versa which yeah. one has the most moving parts in it probably the cable driven because you know ultimately the limb driver is trying to come up all the time yeah and it can still have the cage and stuff to hold the arrow but it's trying to come up the cable driven has a bunch of internal mechanisms to where you can cock most of them you can cock it up and it stays there but then when you pull it back there's actually if you've ever took a, a lot of the drop boys away there's a little square part that pulls down and then releases the tension of the rest so that it comes on up further and drops when you shoot so there's more internal moving stuff as a rule of thumb, not on every one. I mean, like we're both, or you're, I think you're, have you got the Trinity? No, I'm running the, just the original limb okay. driver on my. I got that Trinity, uh, Hamsky rest on mine and it's badass, but it does have like three ball bearings and all this in it, you know, so it's sort of fancy, but, um, it still don't have as much internal stuff as some of the cable driven stuff, but either one worked just fine. You know, we've had our, Actually, we've had a few problems with with limb driven and cable driven through the years, but it's nothing like it's not. It's generally not one specific problem or one specific manufacturer. It's just you know, it's just it is what it is. It's man made. Yeah, I mean anything yeah. can happen. And I wonder if if he's if he's bow hunting in Alberta. I know it gets cold up there. Yeah. And, you know, we've heard, you know, we've had people come in the shop to hunt Indiana, Ohio, Illinois. Yep. And they won't even touch a drop away rest. Yeah. And they say because it freezes up up there. Yep. 
even Whisker Biscuit, I guess they still make it. I know they did back in the day. They made a spray called No Snow that you'd spray on that biscuit and it would make it not ice up, you know. But, so, I mean, that's just something also to think about, too. That's yeah. another thing to throw in the mix. If you're I, don't, a, I don't know anything about I mean, that. either. Like, I've never hunted or I've never had to deal with hunting in super-duper-duper duper cold weather, so no idea. Next one we got is from Jason D. on Facebook. How many turns can I take off my limb bolts? According to the bow. Some bows you can only take like three off. Some bows you can take 13 off. Some bows you can completely let out till the string relaxes and change the string without a press. So you just got to know what model it is, you know. Mm. On average, now <laughs> I'm saying on average, there's bows you can't do this, but most bows you can take four turns off of safely. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's a lot more that you can take six or seven off. There's a few, like some of the super adjustable diamonds and PSEs and all that, you can go 13 turns or more off. And there's a couple, you just let them off. Some of the older Botex, you could take the bolt all the way out, change the dang string out if you wanted to, and then crank them all the way back in. It's a lot of work, but it works. If you don't, I mean, most bows come with an owner manual. I know some of them don't anymore. Well, you can but find it on internet, online, yeah. you know, just check online. If it's a, don't know what bow you got, Jason, but if you've got a, a PSE, I know some of those, you can take 13 turns out of the limb pocket or off the limb bolt so you know just if it's a PSE, just go to google and you be able to find what you need yep and then last question i got is from tony on archery talk best bow press for the diy archer that's a good one um i actually i've, I've i get asked this a little bit i guess it's according to if you want like full-blown press or if it can be portable um if i was going if you if you want like a full-blown bow press probably that last chance easy green is the way to go you know they're about 400 bucks or a little more and it's a full-blown do whatever you want to do bow press it will not press a crossbow but other than that and it won't press you know the hoyts have to have the special fingers but it'll the newer hoyts like within the past three year hoyts uh, it's a good one, but there's also that Cinnam press. You know, it's like a portable rope style press, and it's what about a hundred bucks or so? I think so. Definitely look it up. You know, it'd be a great one. Pack. To, yeah, to throw put, in your you, pack. put in your pack, or if you're just tinkering around at home, some it'd be perfect. You know, they still make the Bowmaster. It's even cheaper than that. I think it's a little more complicated. You got to crank and do all this stuff. That Cinnam, you just pull some cords and boom, it's pressed. But those are sort of your your options kind of up to four hundred dollars you know and then you can spend a lot more than that but you know the, just the good thing about the last chance is they make now make that draw board add-on so like you could get the last chance and then for another whatever i don't know how much it is 150 bucks maybe you can get that draw board and you can do like you can really tune some stuff with that but if you're not into all that then that cinema or even the bowmaster you know for 100 bucks around that price just be sure whichever way you run want to think safety yeah because i mean people this don't realize how much tension these limbs are holding together until something blows <laughs> you know if you've got i know they make a wide limb adapter for mm-hmm. the primes and matthews make sure what just you know do your homework because you don't want to blow up a two thousand dollar rig sitting mm-hmm. in a bow press no. so you know that's that's what i kind of preach just you know if you're going to try to skimp out on something, it might cost you more in the long run. Yeah. So, I think it I think the easy green easy green press. I think that'd be a good one just for mm-hmm. you know putting in some peep sights or maybe having to put a twist or two in a string. And, Another thing we should say is the old apple presses, which it, people probably don't know what I'm talking about, but it's like the it has two arms that go out with r- rubber rollers on it, and then it's got a bar in the middle with two rubber rollers on it. They will not work on pretty much any bow made in the past decade. Yeah, they were made for older bows with long limbs, and you you put two rubber uh, things on the riser, and then the other two come up from the bottom, and they go on the end of the limb. And what it worked on was compressing that riser down, you know, and pushing those limbs in. But you can't with the parallel limb bows that have been out in the past ten years. You can't use it. You got to have something that comes in 
from the ends, you know. So I think the Outback was the last Matthews that you could. I remember it being hard to press. You yeah. had to really get it right. I know we did the switchback, and it was a pain. Mm-hmm. The switchback, I remember being okay. We can't press it, press any more of these, or yep. it might turn into some trouble. Yep. But yeah, that's that's a good question. I've been meaning to get on our website and maybe put some little tuning packages together, like uh, some basic kits with like serving and knock pliers and that type of stuff. And maybe, you know, could probably sell it for 25 to 35 bucks and then maybe a little more advanced one with some more stuff. And then like a super advanced one with like lasers and all the stuff we kind of use, you know, it'd probably be a couple hundred bucks, but I just, I need to do it. But anyway, well, that's all I got. Good old questions. Thank y'all for yep. sending those in. We uh, couldn't do it without you. That's right. So text us if you have any questions, 843-560-9898. Uh, you can email them to archeryshack at gmail.com. And, of course, if you just need to old-fashioned call us, which we've had plenty of people do, our shop number is 864-735-8484. And that goes for if you need, you know, to call us, we can tune your bow, we can make you a bowstring, we can uh, sell you a lot of stuff. We can talk to you about how to tune something or whatever, you know. We have a lot of people call and say, hey, I heard you or I seen a video, I'm having this problem, and in five minutes we can kind of talk them through it. Had a lot of people shipping bows this past year, which was cool. And even that last bow we sold in here today, they found us on YouTube through a review video I did and drove like two and a half hours here to get a bow. That's pretty cool. And that's the whole reason we've been, you know, started doing some of these videos and podcasts was just to kind of reach out to people. And the videos started working, you know, people calling and sending in stuff and stopping by. And we had a lot of people come from a couple hours away and then these podcasts, you know, we were like, well, if it works, it works. If it don't, we'll kill it after two or three of them. And we keep getting questions and calls and stuff saying we heard y'all. So appreciate it. And the biggest thing, like that guy today, he said there's we were the closest shop to him in what, four hour a four-hour radius is what he said, I think. I can't remember. I, I hadn't was... even thought about it. First thing this morning, we had two people come in from four hours away yeah. down in the low part of the state. I didn't even thought about that. And then our last people, they came and bought a Prime. Uh, he said, I seen your Prime video, and they were two and a half or whatever hours away. And uh, he said, first of all, we didn't have a Prime dealer nowhere near us. And he said, second of all, all of our shops have closed down. And that, that could be a whole podcast about support your local shop stuff. But at the same time, I realized you can read online, there's a lot of shops that are assholes out there that, you know what I mean? When they wonder why they closed. Yeah. We we could be like, well, here's what we heard, you know. But um, either way, we appreciate everybody driving in. And like I said, we got the range outside. And we got, you know, we try to, when it's the busy season, you know, we, we do what we can do. But like it's slowing down this time of the year, we can go outside and spend time sighting a bow in and really get everything perfect. So holler if we can help you all out. Yep. Um, I don't know if we got any guests lined up. I know in the next month or so we'll be going to the ata show when this comes out and i'll announce the plans but i'm sure we'll be doing possibly a live something from the ata and definitely a podcast type scenario and all that type of thing so we can keep you all up to date on what's going on please hit the subscribe button for us yes i need to do talk about that too we uh (laughs) we've gained like 150 subscribers in the last month on youtube if you're listening or watching on youtube we're trying to hit a thousand because YouTube changed the rules on us to where we can't do a live video on a mobile device, which is usually how I do it. If I go live on something, you got to have a thousand subscribers to do it. And I don't know why they changed it because a year and a half ago, I gave away some arrows and went live on, on YouTube and it let me do it, you know, and we didn't have but like a hundred subscribers or whatever. So Anyway, I'm just trying to make it easier on us to where we can do that. But we're at like 750-ish, so we don't need many to be there. So I'm figuring next month or three we'll get them. Um, And when we have different videos kind of go viral, kind of like that Prime review when we first got that new Prime in. I mean, it got like 5,000 views in a week or something. So 
that helps a lot. But uh, anyway, yeah, subscribe if you're not already, and uh, we appreciate that. And if you're listening on, you know, one of these podcast uh, audio only things, thank you for that too. Yep. I I've I used to listen to podcasts on like you know Spotify or whatever, but now a lot of times it's just on YouTube because I can kind of see what you know. Even if I'm just riding down the road, I can occasionally glance and see what's going on on the video. And I know it's just us sitting here by like a bunch of bums, but <laughs> still pretty cool. Yep. But anyway, we'll get off here and leave y'all alone for this week. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to y'all later. See y'all next week. Bye.